Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight. It looks like more and more people are finding the show, so that's fantastic. If you would like to watch these live, go to DaveLandry.com slash webinar to register, and register even if the link is old. And you should be good for as many shows as I remember to add. Eventually, we'll run out of shows, but once you register once, you should be good for the next several months. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. Geez, so much to say about that. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Your questions on trading, obviously. Your favorite stock and crypto picks, and we'll do crypto live because crypto is open right now. Just put a dollar sign in front of any crypto and also wait until we get to the live charts just so we, I don't uh, overlook anybody's questions and ask about one at a time. So what are we going to focus on? Well, I've been thinking a lot lately about the pain of trading, and I think the market has has helped me to think about that. And the other thing is, I think it's important for us to recognize the pain and manage it. And we'll get to that in just one second. The question is, is crypto done? And over the last week or so, I was thinking, yeah, I probably need to announce that it's in a bear market. And one of the simple things, just by looking at the 30 EMA, as I talk about quite often, most of the pairs are well below the 30 EMA. And if they're below the 30 EMA, just pretty much leave them alone. But then I started establishing positions over the last several days. It's nowhere near as much fun as it was a few weeks back, where you put on a position, and by the time you put on the next position or whatever, your first position already hit the IPT. Kind of just the opposite now. It's like uh, they're stopping up or taking forever to hit the IPT. We'll get to that in just one second. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up, all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, lately I've been thinking a lot about how we're in the pain management business. We're also in the energy management business. We really have to manage our own energy. And what takes energy away from us and what gives us energy. But I think that's another presentation in and of itself. And one thing I was thinking about tonight is I'm putting together all these slides and I've been working on them on and off all day. And I woke up and wrote mostly three pages just on this, is that I was a little bummed out because there's so much I want to say. And, and I realized, okay, Dave, this is, this is not going to be a one and done. This is something that I'm going to have to revisit probably quite a bit and possibly often. So as I just said, we're kind of in the in the pain management business, if you think about it. There's there's going to be pain. There will be blood. And in fact, I've done complete presentations where I talk about the percentage of time that you're actually in a drawdown. And believe it or not, it's the majority of the time you're given back open profits or sometimes you're outright losing in your trades. So you have to learn to accept the normal amount of pain. As I was getting ready to go live, I was thinking a lot about like what Mark Douglas says, if you if you put on a trade and there's a lot of stress, you haven't fully accepted the risk of that trade. So there's a lot of tangents we can go off on when it comes to pain management, but there will be pain. And as I often say, there will be blood. And also, and this is one more thing, and again, another tangent, all trades will eventually end badly. And we've got one that we've been in for, I think, about a year and a half now, and it's getting pretty close to that stop. But it's been a fun ride, and it's been a good ride, and we did give up a lot of money in the end, and maybe I'll show that example next week. And hopefully, I know, words you should never say, but hopefully it'll survive the stop and keep on going. Now, for core trend trades, in other words, if you're trading my methodology, and especially if you're following along, with the service, you occasionally have to accept the pain of open losses like we're seeing now. It's like, um, you know, I look at my screens and I see the equity is getting whacked. And I'm like, what's well, getting whacked? And I see ASO getting hit pretty hard. I'm like, oh, geez, as they, as, uh, they say in Fargo, right? No, I say more than that. But you have to accept the pain of those open losses with the hopes. And I know, again, I said hope. I'll say I hope a lot tonight, believe me that the correction is just a normal and healthy one. It's gonna knock some people out, knock out some nervous Nellies, 
maybe knock out some Johnny come lately. So we'll do a little walkthrough on, on possible people behind the trade in a second. And there's some new players that may come in the market and those old players that were knocked out might come back in. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff happens in a correction. Now, sometimes a correction turns into something more than just that. And obviously you kind of hate yourself a little bit when you ride a correction way down and finally get stopped out. Then you think, geez, why did I give up all those open profits? Well, if you go back and look at it, and this is something I didn't want to do, and, and maybe it's better to wait when we get stopped out to show you just in case. But I've been wanting to, and I've done this before, show you like how much how much open profits you give up over and over and over in these longer term winners, and how each time that happens, it 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 kind of it kind of takes as 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 the British would say, it takes the piss out of you a little bit. But longer term, if you can deal with that pain, that's how you're going to make a lot of money longer term. Now, longer term is the key word in that sense. Now, you have to accept some FOMO pain and, and recognize selective perception. And that's when, a reason I put that in there, because it's, it's kind of, I can see now it's a little random reading it out loud. But what I'm referring to there is like lately we've been in this crazy market. And when we get to the P's, I'll, I'll show you how crazy it is. But I think if you've been trading over the last couple of weeks, you know up one day, down the next, up half a day, down the rest of the day. You know, it's crazy. And lately, I haven't recommended anything on a service. We're back to that sitting on our hands thing. And then every now and then you're like, oh, geez, we seem to have missed one. But we're all guilty of this selective perception, which comes with being a human being, where you might see something get away. But for everyone that gets away, you probably would have had 10 losses. And believe me, it wasn't worth it. Self-inflicted wounds, I am not holier than thou here. <laughs> you know, I had somebody visit last week and I was really nervous about having him watch the sausage get made. And luckily, and I, I, and I think it's one of those, what's that Heisenberg thing with the, with the, the physics or whatever, that it, it, through the observation, you're changing what's being observed. So maybe just maybe I was on my best behavior. My mom, my uh, my mom, my wife warned me. She said, uh, you know, she said, don't be a hero in there and don't show off. And she also said, don't be a dick. <laughs> She's very frank with me. Now, these self-inflicted wounds, you need to feel enough pain to say, well, I'll do that once. OK, and, and not let it creep you. And, and will I do that once came from. It's kind of a long story, but after my first child was born, a uh, biological child, I was very nervous and stressed out, as you would imagine. And I went to get a little cash out the ATM and buy some fast food or whatever. And uh, the I left the card in the machine, and the machine ate the card. And, and my wife sort of gave me a pass. And she says, well, you'll do that once. And then anytime she screws up, especially if she screwed up before, I'll remind her, oh, you'll do that once. But anyway, try to say, okay, I'll, I'll do that once and learn from that. And if you learn from it, it's not a complete loss. And one thing I, that I was thinking of lately is when I make a mistake that I've made before, it's like, how many times do we have to relearn a lesson? And I'll tell you something that you could do there to help. And, and I'm not holier than now, you know, listen to what I say and not always what I do, but there are some things you could do there. One big problem that I see quite often, and we're all guilty as human beings, okay, and again, I don't want to come off holier than now, is that you have to recognize, but it was working so well, syndrome, and you and the markets change or some combination thereof. Now, but it was working so well syndrome, every now and then you're you're gonna get into a state of flow. And and boy, if I could figure out how to get into that state of flow, stay into that state of flow, and recognize when I'm not in that state of flow, I think I would own the world. And uh, Mahaley Chisholm, Mahaley, it's, or I can't say his last name without seeing it. it, it's about that long. He wrote a book on flow, it's really good. But sometimes you get into a state of flow with the with the market and um What's the expensive violin, Stradivarius? Is that the right word? 
I have a client that tells me sometimes he feels like he's playing a Stradivarius in the market, you know? But you print money and you can do no wrong. And I know many clients, past and present, and I know a couple of you are gonna say, hey, Dave, are you talking about me? Like, well, I'm talking about you and many others that I've crossed paths with who print money for some extended periods and then have a bit of a blow up. These traders have mad skill, in some cases, mad skills. In some cases, I'm jealous and I can be admittedly a little goaded by what they're doing and end up with some self inflicted wounds. I am not a scalper. I know scalpers that are pretty incredible at what they do, and I'm not one. Unfortunately, occasionally they forget that things can change drastically. For instance, the volatility of the market can drop way off or can increase, but for somebody who's doing a, a very short-term type of trading, if that volatility dries up and the volume dries up, in a combination with that, it could get a little dangerous and tough to trade. So these traders have mad skills. And again, sometimes I'm, I'm jealous, but eventually suffer from, but it was working so well, syndrome. Now recently, I don't think I have it on my desk. Some of this presentation is expired, by, expired, inspired by a book I just finally got around to reading. It's a book full of interviews with people, Linda Rasky and quite a few others. I think Van Tharp might be in there or somebody references. I think Steen Barger references Van Tharp. But anyway, it's few. It's pretty good. Most of the articles in there are pretty good. Um, and one of the things they talked about was, was a little bit of neurology. And I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense. And sometimes you have to hear things for the fourth or fifth time for it to sink in. It was a bit of an aha moment, but after I got to thinking about it, I was like, well, I sort of already knew a lot of that stuff, but definitely want to give the, them credit where credit is due. And I'll have the title, I'll put the title in, in post for you. But there is a neurology and a psychology at work here. Now, when things are going swimmingly, dopamine is, is being released. And what's happening, and it might not be known to you, but or unbeknownst to you, is that you're creating an urge to keep doing what feels good. Now, when things change, either with you or the markets, you might find yourself chasing that high. And as I often say, unfortunately, bad emotions have twice the impact of good emotions, and that's actually been measured. And I know some of you guys, I think it's Craig was saying, he thinks it's 10 times and many more. And boy, it sure feels like 10 times sometimes. So that's what creates the so-called gambler's ruin. You end up chasing that high and the losses hit you really hard. And then the gains don't really have that same effect. I, I don't get, I, I really don't get excited when I have a big gain. I just kind of feel like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Keep doing the right thing. Keep doing the right thing. But boy, when I have losses, I, I lose my shit. I really do. Now, one thing I've been kind of wanting to do for a while, and, and I think I'm going to have to revisit this because I'm not really happy how this turned out. But the idea is not to explain to you exactly what happens, because if I knew exactly what happened, you'd probably never see my fat ass again. Well, let me just back up a second here and tell you where I'm coming from. I like reading old, old books on the markets, especially old books that discuss technical analysis and psychology more than anything. And I love them when they kind of walk you through a bull and a bear market cycle. And they tell you about what happens and how the sentiment of all the players change. And it really helps you to wrap your head around reading some of these things as far as how markets actually work and it kind of reassures you you're trading traders and not markets and it's the sentiment of the market that matters and you can't really measure sentiment okay even though some people think you can you can't anyway so i love reading those old books where they explain how the euphoria sets in and then people buy stocks at any prices and then the market crashes and all the things that happen in between so I just got to thinking, like, how could I explain this maybe through like an IPO? So an IPO comes public. And remember, we're trading traders, not markets. So all these little people in the background 
or traders or potential traders or investors if you uh, are also investors possibly too. And when a stock first comes public, let's say it's a really crazy go-go stock, it goes straight up. Well, you might have the early adopters. You could have some people that were pre-IPO investors. And we'll talk about those guys a little bit in a second. But if they were fortunate enough, like in this case, to get the, the stock pre-market, pre-IPO, then they make some deals to not dump it on the market right away. Otherwise, they'll never get another IPO. Anyway, so early adopters, and this could be people that are playing a theme. You know, Rivian comes to mind with this, or however you say it. I just call it RIVN. But it went straight up when it first came public, and the excitement was, hey, it's electric cars, okay? It's going to be the next Tesla is probably what these people were thinking. And then the FOMO kicks in, and a lot of the FOMO has these FOMO fear fueled traders jumping in the market. And if it sets up just right, maybe maybe we're doing a buy at B. And, and John and I were just talking about IPOs uh, before we went live. And John's here tonight. He's a resident IPO expert in the group. And we were talking about just various things that we haven't seen a whole lot of IPOs lately. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that in a minute or two. But anyway, buy at B is one of the patterns that John really likes and talks about quite a bit. And what, one of the good things about IPOs is that, as we were talking about pre-market, pre-show, I should say, is that the rules are fairly well defined. So anyway, without going off too far on a tangent, it could be some of us going in here as buy at B traders. Now, when it gets really, really frothy at this level, a lot of the fickle Johnny come latelys come in. And they'll buy at any price and they have very little staying power and they're also very emotional traders and you could get a lot of selling by these guys early on and sometimes that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back as people often say a bull market ends when the last person buys right now as the stock begins to slide, the people who missed out on the first run might start looking to buy it. Some shorts might pile on. And again, it's impossible to explain or know what all the players are, but just know that there's a lot of players. And also know that the players are changing. Now, let's say it rallies out of a pullback, then we might go after it as a core trend trade, kind of more like the core methodology, a TKO or a pullback, or maybe like a Landry Light pullback to 30 EMA or something like that might occur. And we may or may not hit the initial profit target and we might just flat out stop out. You know, it happens, right? And as this thing begins to drop, more and more and more and more and more people are at a loss, provided, of course, they're still holding the stock, okay? And you might have some of these early adopters or let's say the pre-IPO people are chomping at the bit to bail out as soon as they're allowed. So that could be some pent up demand coming into the market, could exacerbate the slide. Shorts might start coming in and piling on and that could actually create some pent up buying. But initially shorts harm the market or can harm the market. And then it might just start trading all over the place, right? And at this point, it's everybody left that's still in, debating whether to get in and out of the stock. And as I preach, people sell stocks for a variety of reasons. They have, when they have money, they buy them. When they sell, they sell stocks when they need them. And others use more sophisticated methods. And that's Marion McClellan's quote, Tom McClellan's late mother, Marion said that quote, everybody uses, uses timing in their investing. So you never know what happens when these consolidations happen. And it could be just everyone else fighting it out. And it could be day traders coming in. It could be a bunch of people coming in. And maybe some people looking for, to hold on for dear life. And at some point, if it's got enough volume, maybe some institutional interests. The point I'm trying to make here is that the makeup of the traders changes and the personality of the stock is made up 
by the people who are trading it, okay? And again, we're trading traders, not markets. So ideally, you want to recognize when something has changed. If you were long back here, or let's say you came in and did day, trade or day trades every day, and this thing's going up 10 points a day, and you're making 10 points a day and feeling like a genius, then all of a sudden it starts to implode. If you can't short, you're trying to fight this short-term trend, okay? And then eventually you might end up in a crazy market like this, and this same little thing that I'm showing here on a daily chart might be playing out intraday. So things change, obviously. And that's one of the problems with, but it was working so well. Now, as far as you changing, that's gonna be a hard one to figure out, but it could have something to do with your career outside of trading. And I'm friendly with some of you guys, and some days you're trading like madmen, and then other days you're nowhere to be found. And it's like, oh, well, I was busy. I had to work that day or I had to do this or whatever. So for better or for worse, that, that could affect your trading, obviously. And if work is not going so well or you're under some kind of pressure or whatever, and you always are under some kind of pressure, right? Then that could certainly affect your trading. Lack of sleep. I get it really, really, really early, which means everyone else isn't necessarily on my schedule as far as going to bed. <laughs> you might have drank too much the night before. You could have a fight with your spouse or significant other or, or both, as I as I say, if you have a fight with both, or if you have both, you might not want to be trading. You've got enough problems to deal with. And one thing that I've talked about over and over again is that your trading spills into your life and your life spills into your trading. And it can end up quite cyclical and self-perpetuating. Okay, I'll go first. I'll have a really shitty day. I kind of wear my feelings on my sleeves. My wife doesn't like me to be in a bad mood. It's okay for her to be in a bad mood, but I'm not allowed to be in a bad mood. So if I'm in a bad mood, then she gets into a bad mood. And next thing you know, we're both in a bad mood. And then the next day I come in and it's kind of like, rrr, rrr, you know, and so <laughs> it, could, it could really be self-perpetuating. All right. So as far as the pain management, and I'm just scratch of the surface here. Uh, number one, of course, as I said earlier, make sure earlier, make sure you have fully accepted the risk of a trade going into that trade. And that's going to help you a lot. It's a hard business. I don't want to make it look like it's easy. And, and I watch a lot of these crypto videos lately. And a lot of these crypto videos are by these young punks that don't understand trading. And and I had a long reply for one guy today and I accidentally deleted it and realized that maybe I'm just wasting my time. But he was saying, don't buy things when they're going up. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, and he's like, buy them when they're buy them when they're going down, buy them when they're low. I'm like, oh God, this is just an idiot. <laughs> but it, it it is a hard business. It it but it's not le nearly as hard as you try to make it. And I'm I'm guilty of that too. If you just follow a longer term or methodology, or short, or in my case, a short to intermediate term methodology, it's fairly cut and dry. And as I preach, sometimes it's almost boring. There's a lot of other things that you could do to create these self inflicted wounds over trade and into wishing. Oh, damn it. I said I'd try to do a webinar without saying that. Into wishing versus intuition, which is a Ed Sakota quote. And a lot of us create our own misery, present company included, right? I'm not holier than now. One thing you need to do is recognize and embrace mistakes and maybe learn something from them. And then make sure you're fully accepting of your methodology. As I've said 10,000 times, I've had people come in when I'm printing money and they think this is the greatest thing ever and tell the boss to go f off or quit a profitable business in one case i know this couple had a very profitable business they're like why are we wasting all time in this very profitable business when we could just work an hour or so a day and do these trades and i tried to talk them out of quitting and i don't know whatever happened to them i'd be willing to bet they had to restart their business because a bad cycle came along but if you could live through a few of these cycles and take the good with the bad don't let the good go in your head, go to your head, right? My best clients come in when things are kind of rocky, 
win a little, lose a little, win a little, lose a little. And they're like, okay, this isn't that easy, but I could see where it sometimes works. And then all of a sudden, bam, we hit the cover off the ball and they feel really good. Like, okay, I, I, I get it now. But you do have to go through a few of those cycles, good, bad, and indifferent. And you know, what's what's crazy is the the pain of of mistakes, the pain of a choppy market, the pain of a sharp reversal or whatever else when these positions go against you. You would think if, after you've been doing this for 30 years that you'd be like, oh, okay, that's just that's just normal. It's like, but no, you still feel the same emotions. And and one, you know, from a psychological standpoint, when you experience something, and I've talked about this ad nauseum too. But let's say you experience something that's aggravating and you kind of lose your shit. It's not that one little thing in and of itself. And I've given examples before, like, like my wife lost her, her shit with my daughter because she told her to give the dogs water. And she told her over and over. And she's like, if you don't give the dogs water tonight, you're not going to go on that fun little bus trip tomorrow. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'll do it in a little while. And she never did it. And my wife kind of blew up a little bit i blow up a lot too so it's not just her but it wasn't that one little forgetting to give the dog water right because she does that every day it was the everyone that's ever happened so i think it was douglas that said talked about that so the pain of a losing trade has a lot of other losing trades connected to it and it's complicated right i know it's pretty easy on the surface but it can be complicated not as complicated as we try to make it, but it's still pretty complicated. So you have to fully accept your methodology, understand it good, bad, and indifferent. I see people go out and do things the same day I, I, I teach a pattern. And it's like, no, I, I, you know, as I say, find a hundred examples and more importantly, play a little devil's advocate, find out when it just flat out doesn't work. Don't wing it. I mean, we're all guilty of this on occasion. It's fun to wing it sometimes. And be super careful of S and G trades. Sometimes we talk about S and G trades to bars option ex expiration. I'll probably fire off some gamma plays where I see an option that I think is cheap and can't believe that they would sell it to me that cheap. Okay. And at the end of the day, when it expires worthless, now I know why they sold it to me that cheap. They took my money. And I'll just have to be cognizant of that and, and maybe play it a smaller way. I know you can't get a little bit pregnant. And one thing I'm guilty of too is trading not to lose. And I have to recognize that as I go to do it. And this is this is this isn't within the core methodology. This is when I'm doing something like an intraday trade or an ETF or possibly a stock. I'll see one of you guys in and out of a stock doing really well. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go in because I'll just risk a half a point and we'll see what happens. And then guess what? I lose a half a point. And a lot of times when you're trying to just lose a little bit, okay, you end up losing a lot more because by the time you get your orders in or whatever, it gets away from you. So make sure you are trading to win when it really looks like a good time to trade as opposed to trading not to lose. Now, one thing I'm a huge advocate of is morning pages. And I've talked about this quite a bit, so I won't bore you too much, I promise. But if you wake up every day and write three handwritten pages, you're going to learn a lot about yourself, a lot about your business, a lot about trading, a lot about what's happening in the world. And if you keep making the same mistakes over and over and keep writing about them over and over, you become a bit of Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Now, when you do make a painful mistake, did you really just do that once or did you do that a bunch of times in the past? It was, um, what's the guy's name? He wrote principles. He had a pretty bad drawdown. Hopefully there was nothing. Hopefully he didn't um, lose his discipline, but in principles, what's this guy's name? Um, I'll have it in post. Starts with a D. It escapes me. But uh, anyway, he wrote that if, they come across a situation where something goes wrong, they document it and it becomes another one of those. And if you keep having another one of those, eventually you need to come up with a rule for that, okay? Uh, another one of those I'm guilty of 
I get really busy with life, trading, business, and now crypto or whatever else is, is, is happening, although, although crypto has cooled off, obviously. And I'll forget that it's a Fed day, okay? And I'll be long or short S&P futures going into Fed announcement. And I feel like, well, I'll do that once, you know? And that needs to be another one of those. I need to ask myself, hey, is it Wednesday Fed day? Or maybe have some commitment device, maybe on Fed days or a week ahead of time, put a sticky note. Wednesday is Fed day, you moron. <laughs> Now, I realize I just kind of scratched the surface there, and this is something that we definitely will revisit, and I'm a nerd. I'm looking forward to revisiting it. These are This slide was left over from last week, and I'll flesh some of these things out as we look into them. My concern now is that we are in a bit of a crypto bear market, but it also seems to be improving, and I do have some positions on. So let's shift gears. Let's go take a look at some crypto charts. And then I'll shift gears and we'll go to, we'll go take a look at what's going on in stocks and the overall market. Okay, a couple of things that were on that previous slide. Go in and watch last week's presentation for a lot more on that. The one thing I have been thinking a lot about is, just like we watched the S&P 500 to kind of gauge whether or not we should be putting on a lot of trades. Now, as I often say, if you love a setup, take the setup, okay? Regardless of what the P's are doing. But in some cases, if it's kind of a mediocre setup or you've got three or four setups that are mediocre, instead of piling in all those setups, if the S&P is doing really poorly, maybe you might want to sit on your hands unless you just absolutely can't stand it because it's the best setup ever. So with that said, Bitcoin and then Ethereum might be two to watch, okay? Notice the Landry light coming down in here that we've had for a while. So Bitcoin, at least for now, appears to be in a downtrend and as does Ethereum. Ethereum not quite as ugly as Bitcoin, but it might have far, farther to fall, who knows? So those two could be possible bellwethers. One thing that's kind of, fascinating me is I know you're going to party with me is the 30 day moving average as I just flipped through a few of these there was one that was above it most of them are below 30 and just look at how much pain and I know I've been beating a dead horse in this so I won't spend too much time on it but look at how much pain you could avoid just by not trading them or certainly think about exiting them when they are below the 30-day uh, moving average, and look at this one here. It's it's lost what quite a bit of its value. Same there, and I can go through all these. By the way, while I'm here, I just have a few more things to cover in crypto. If you guys want to look at any of these pairs, let me know, and I'll take a look at them while we're here. But again, one after another underneath the 30 EMA. And I think just by not buying them, as long as they're below the 30 EMA, you could do really well. As I said recently, back in November, I was printing money. Why? Well, these things were going up, okay? Don't buy them if they're going up. Okay. <laughs> well, I bought this one at, I don't know, five cents, six cents. It ran up to what, 15 cents? Okay. Buy them when they're going down. Well, I don't know. It was at 10 cents here, and now it's at 7 cents. That's 30, 40% cent, 40 drop. So a lot of bad advice out there. I know everybody here knows this. Everybody here is in the Facebook group. Facebook group is right there. Dave Landry's Trend Traders. Uh, open to anyone who is a, you have to be a gold member of DaveLandry.com, FYI, if you're watching this. All right, so you can see a lot of these are going down. If the market is really hot, and right now it's not, but I still take a look at this just in case. Sometimes you can just buy the hottest pairs that are going up the most. And let's see if there's anything that kind of fits that bill. See, this is kind of interesting, but you can see the long tails in here and it's kind of all over the place. So that's a little scary. That one has caught my eye quite a bit. And if we, if everything was blowing and going right now, I probably would have bought this one, but it does have some long tails. So it looks like it can be kind of thin. So you have to be really careful with that one. But you can see, even though we've sorted these by the strongest pairs, most of these look pretty darn weak longer term. That one's warming up a little bit. 
So again, 30 day EMA, your best friend. We're not in a rip roaring bull market, so no need to rush out and start buying crypto. Let me show you what's in my open portfolio. Now I was nearly flat a few days ago, and now I have a few on. Blue is just stuff I'm keeping an eye on or I was keeping an eye on, okay? Remember this one last week? I ended up losing money on this trade. This one, of course, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, was breaking out last Thursday when I was doing this webinar. But anyway, blue is things I'm keeping an eye on and the big boys such as Bitcoin, Ethereum. The purple is pairs that I'm long. And you can see not doing fantastic in these. Some of these are okay, like Luna's beginning to rally out of this pullback. I think I got a little profits there. KOK was one that I've been in for quite a while. I'm free rolling on it. Uh, Cyan means free rolling. And then this one, uh, Avalanche, is one that I recently got in. Again, I still had an older position still on, longer term trend following mode, just barely avoided being stopped out. And then I did an add on trade, which so far it's not working. So, as you can see, I'm not super excited about crypto right now. I might end up going back to 100% cash and just sitting on some cash and waiting for an opportunity. And patience, believe it or not, not doing anything is obviously the secret to trading, as I preach quite often. Okay, let's uh, shift gears and go to the to the market or to the stocks if uh, you guys don't want to talk about anything in crypto. Now, uh, right before the show got started, John I, John and I were talking and I asked him if he's been seeing any IPOs because I, I can't find an IPO pretty much to save my life. Or certainly when I do find one, I'm not that excited about it. And he said he's not really seeing a whole lot. And we, we were talking about the fact that they can be self-regulating. And that's something that I covered in the IPO course that I did a while back. And by that, I mean, in good conditions, you're going to get more setups. And in bad conditions, like now, you're going to get fewer and fewer or actually no setups. So that's one of the beautiful things about IPOs, trading IPOs, is sometimes the market regulates itself. And you are you might be trying to let's see if we can do this. You don't have to try so hard to make something happen. And with 4,000 stocks actively traded or however many are maybe 5,000 or more it it always feels like this something you should be doing if you want to talk about any individual stocks feel free to bring them up now I know the Facebook group has kind of eliminated that for anybody that's in the group but if anybody's not in the group then or even if you're in the group and want to look at something let me know now one thing with the P's let me get rid of these moving averages real quick and this is what I was talking about a trading service tonight the market sold off hard Okay, bounce right back, sold off hard, sold off hard, bounced back, tried to rally, came back in, went straight up for a couple of days, chop, 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 began to implode, went straight back up, almost to all time highs. Once again, all time highs were here. And then today, opened a gap reversal and sold off hard, giving up a lot of yesterday's gains. So it's kind of all over the place. And if you're wondering why I'm not showing a lot of setups, either longs or shorts, if you go back in time a little bit, you can see that we haven't made much forward progress in a long, long time, okay? So what's that, a month and a half? That's a long time to just chop around in the market. So this is why I've been selective and I've been letting the database tell me what to do. If I go through my database over and over and over and over, can't find a setup to save my life, I know I shouldn't be trading. If within first five minutes or 10 minutes of going through the database, I've got six or seven stocks that I just absolutely love, then I know it's time to trade. I mean, if I wasn't doing a trading service, I think probably the best thing to do would be set a timer for 10 minutes. And if I can't find a stock within 10 minutes, then there's probably nothing to trade. Now, keep in mind, I flipped through charts really quick. I could probably go through a thousand charts in, a ten, in 10 minutes. But the best, the best setup says I preach, just kind of jump out at me. All right, NASDAQ Composite tried to rally today, big gap, had a big fat rally yesterday. It was beautiful, big fat rally. No, today, <laughs> little gap, big sell off today. It's been a dream last couple of days with the ETFs, the leverage ETFs, because the market has just been moving so much. Russell 2000, a bit of a bummer. Let's put the bow tie moving averages in there. We had a bow tie trigger recently. It's been selling off out of that bow tie. 
and it's approaching the recent lows in here. So that's a bit of a concern. Very important for those lows to hold. Energies, as you can see, just lost a lot of steam in here as of late. So it's hard to get excited about in energy stocks, even though we had a few here and there in a landry list. Now, foods are starting to melt up. Foods in general aren't the best stocks in the world to trade. I'd much rather trade a biotech or a semiconductor or something like that. But hey, we might have to play the hand that's dealt, and maybe there might be some food setting up soon that are worth trading. We'll just have to wait and see. A lot of areas, banks kind of in a downtrend here below the 30 you may. Financials tried to rally today, came back in. Drugs have been going straight up for whatever reason. I don't know why, I don't watch the news, but they're actually not that far away from all time highs. Let's see if we can get there. Biotech though, not so much, stalling out a little bit. Looks like it wants to drop back below the moving averages for the most part, still remains in a downtrend. Retail was really rallying big yesterday. It looks like it was gonna go to brand new highs and beyond, right? Today I did a 180 all the way back in, down, what's that, One point. 8, 6%, nearly 2%. Semiconductors got absolutely whacked today. Nice little gap higher, and then they imploded. Not the end of the world here, but I sure would like to see these recent lows hold. And I am a big fan, as I preach each week, of the semiconductors confirming what I see in the overall market. So that's it for the market. You can see it's a little questionable out there. Let's just wait and see, wait for setup. So Landry List is what, three or four or five stocks tonight? It's not too many. When you see 20 in there, you know I had to spend a lot of time culling down to get to those 20. When you see three or four, that's all I could find. Right now I have about 100 stocks in my momentum list and I was looking at them tonight. It's like, boy, I really need to call them down. Usually when it gets to two or 300, it's like, okay, it's time to call. But so many of those stocks in that list are just crappy and all over the place that I'm just like, wow, I really need to clean this list up. Okay, any questions, any individual stocks? Hopefully my mic's been on. <laughs> so, all right, well, while we're in impasse, I wanna thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your business schedule to be here. Anything, anything unanswered, if you're in Facebook, bring it to Facebook. If not, leave a comment below in YouTube and I do answer all comments that are looking for an answer at least. And if you need to contact me directly, daylander.com slash contact. Everybody have a great night. Everybody enjoy your weekend and may the trend be with you. You're welcome, Mark.